some of you here are too young to uh, to know about the pet rock. Has anybody ever heard of a pet rock? <laughs> yeah. a, pe a pet rock was a rock that someone decided to make into a pet, and they sold it in little cellophane bags. And people paid money for it, real money. Now, they could have gone outside and picked up some rocks and painted them colors, and said, so I have a pet rock. But it would not have been a commercial success. So for years, I can't remember the years, so we're telling on ourselves, right? <laughs> for, so for years, people had pet rocks. Um, but some smart capitalists figured out that some fool consumer would pay for pet rocks. That's essentially what capitalists do. That's their job. Now, everybody is not being wasteful if you decide to do something with clothing or jewelry or something like that. But literally, how much stuff do we need? How much stuff does America need? Think about it. 73% of our GDP comes from goods and services, the purchase of goods and services. 73%. So if people don't buy anything, the economy doesn't grow. But what if you don't need anything? Are you supposed to buy something even when you don't need something? Remember after September 11th, um, Mr. Bush was asked, um, what can people do to help America? Do you know what he said? Go shopping. He said, go shopping. Now, I guess he wanted to circulate a little money in the economy, but also speaks to, in some ways, how perverted our values are. Go shopping. So I call it sports shopping. You feel good, you shop. You feel bad, you shop. You need, you need new clothes because you got a new job, you shop. You need new clothes because you lost your job and you can't go to work or you can't lay up in your work clothes. So you have to go buy some casual clothes. So you shop. You need to get a good new um, partner. So you got to go shop because you have a new partner. You're happy. You break up with your partner, you have to go shop because all the other stuff reminds you of that prior partner. Surely you do not intend for me to sleep on the same sheets I slept on with the other partner. We must take these to Goodwill and purchase ourselves some new sheets. This is our shopping. You go somewhere, will you bring me something back? And so then you go into a Hudson's, I'm not picking on Hudson's, or some junk store and buy somebody a magnet I hear, look at what I brought you back. I said, I'm going to bring me back. Same me I left out with, I'm going to bring me back. No, I'm not buying you any junk because I went on a business trip and returned from the business trip, which was my reasonable expectation. But in any case, we sort of weave shopping into almost everything. We do. It's the America's favorite sport. And what it does is ends up with lots of us in debt, more debt than we need to be in, lots of us who aren't able to pay any number of our bills, a shifting credit landscape where what was good and okay today is not good or okay tomorrow. So in other words, if you happen to, um, they, they decide to tighten up the requirement, you had a score of 720, but now they want you to have 740 to have this particular card, they can say, you have to pay all the money up now. Or don't charge any more because you're not qualified to have this card that you've had all these years. That's how so many people risk foreclosure that's how many, so many other things happen. But the credit card machine keeps grinding to the point where the average person will get more than 10, I mean, more than 10 uh, invitations to get new credit cards per year. That doesn't sound, that's just one a month. I know people who get one a week, one a day. One of my lovely and delightful nephews, 30 years old and a comedian, which is funny. I told him he really would be a comedian when he paid his rent with his comedy money. Um, but in any case, he told me, Aunt Julian, Bank of America sent me a credit card. I said, no, nah, Sonny, they sent you an application. He said, yes, but they say that I can have $1,000. I said, uh, did they say you had to pay it back? He said, they didn't mention it. I said, okay, there's this thing called fine print. I want you to read it. He said, aren't you busy? I said, I'm very busy, but I would like you to read the fine print. Now, the only testament that I have to the fact that this child has spent any time with me in his life is he's reading the fine print, and when he gets to 25.6%, he said, oh, no, that's usury. I said, when did you learn the word usury? He said, you gave a speech about it one time. I said, right? I said, praise the Lord. He said, they want too much money. I can't do all that. I said, okay, then don't fill out the application for the credit card. But you know, there were two credit card-related suicides in Tennessee in 1997. Both of them were young people. They were students. They both happened to be Caucasian. And when I read the data, I said, yeah, because black folks don't kill themselves. 
over stuff like that. You know, where's Maurice? He ain't here. <laughs> I'm calling looking for Maurice. Yeah, I told you he ain't here. <laughs> Maurice needs to get back to us. He died, click. <laughs> the people will still be looking. Call up, how can I, can I help you, Maurice? Maurice, sure you can help me. Can you pay this bill for me? Because I don't intend to pay it. So, you know, people re respond to these things very differently, but the fact is that young people do not fully develop their discernment until about age 23, 24. They're sending you credit cards when you're 18 years old. They're sending you credit cards when you're impulsive. They're sending you credit cards when you're going to charge pizza and pay 23% interest or pizza pie that you don't even really like or don't need the calories for. But this is how the credit thing has basically built itself into our culture. People don't even use cash. People believe that something is wrong with cash. And if don't, do not. Do not try to purchase an airline ticket with cash. Truly, it is almost worse than approaching a ticket counter with a weapon. If you buy an airline ticket with cash, they will want to, they don't want just your license and registration. They will want a relative's license and re registration. Preferably, oh no, 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 here's the worst. P attempt to purchase a one-way ticket in cash. Now, I'm not saying that you're going across the pond. I'm saying you're going around the corner. You know, you're going from DC to New York. One-way ticket, shuttle, cash? You might as well just, you know, strip down before you get there. You know, because they're gonna wanna know everything about you. But cash has almost become obsolete and credit becomes a necessity. Even if you're, but it's a trip and a trap. And again, when we say how, do I, how I got over, who didn't get over? The person who overindulged in credit. And it's so easy to do. Our whole economy has overindulged in credit, quite frankly, and that's why we end up with the mortgage meltdown. But we have to look at the fact that a third of the black and brown people who had subprime mortgages, guess what? Qualified for real mortgages. Qualified for, for good mortgages. Why did they get them? Because the vultures came around them and said, you're not going to be able to go to Bank of America and get this, but I've got this special deal for you. Then these balloons and ARMs, they basically trick you into wanting to, um, who says that they're not going to do better next year? Let me put it that way. Who would say, I say to you, you, you think you're going to make more money next year than you make this year? You'd probably say, heck yeah, right? You, you, your heart, you look like a hardworking young man. You're not going to, you know, no, I'm, I'm going to make less. You're going to do your best to make more. So the ARM, a balloon loan thing, works like this. Well, see, you're going to keep this rate of interest for five years, but you know you're going to stop be making more money in, in five years. You know you're going to make more money. So you know you can afford a better mortgage. Well, sure, if we don't have a recession. Sure, if nothing else bad happens. You know, basically, it doesn't make sense to ask you to bet against yourself, but that's what's being done, and your pride and everything. Oh, yeah, I'm going to make more money. All those people who are going to make more money now have no house, or their house is swimming underwater. So it's, it's almost a counter-psycho-intuitive -psycho kind of thing. That's not a word, counter-psycho-intuitive. But you guys get my drift. But basically, it's kind of a way of essentially trapping you into a lifestyle you can't afford. Nobody who's 25 or 26 years old can afford, unless they're very wealthy, a $350,000 home, unless they're very wealthy. But the thought is, if you only have to pay $1,000 a month back on it, that's rent. You look up five years later, it's like, OK, now you have to pay $7,000 a month. Huh? You know, my stuff just multiplied by a factor of six. What am I supposed to do? Get out. Exactly. So someone else can go and make that kind of money. How I got over. What does the term how I got over have to do with the term or concept of social and economic justice? Because that becomes the next issue. We all have talked about getting over, but is anyone when we talk about how I got over thinking about beyond their own immediate family, how our society gets over? How people have access to more, to more opportunities? about what we're doing about essentially the least, least and the left out. One of my greatest frustrations, I'm for a piece of paper, which I know is in here. One of my greatest frustrations is the way that we deal with or don't deal with poverty in these United States. We have such significant poverty that is so unaddressed, and we're all so very oblivious to it. When we look at the poverty rate, we're looking at a number of 15.2% up. 
That's almost one, more than one in six Americans. Yeah, one in six Americans who are poor. We're looking at in the African American community a 28% rate. Among uh, Latinos, about a 27, 26, 27% rate, but an 8% rate among whites. We're looking when we look at poverty of this being concentrated highly in inner cities, but increasingly less with gentrification, which is very interesting because then where are all the poor people going to live? And will they have access to the same kinds of services? In cities, you have transportation. In the suburbs, you do not. I live in the serious hood. Well, at least it used to be. The old crack house just sold, renovated, of course, for $1.2 million. The crack house. I just sit outside and look at it and say, oh, that used to be the crack house. Um, I usually say when the people who bought it walk by. <laughs> oh, that used to be the crack house. Just for, you know, quite a tourist value or something like that. But in any case, when you see the gentrification, you see the poor folks leaving. And you wonder where they're going and who then will provide the services for the city. So the poor folks are the folks who are actually working at the Whole Foods, making less an hour than a pound of cheese costs. The folks who are walking because they can't necessarily afford um, to ride. The folks who are being displaced because the buses have to n maneuver around the bike lanes. Um, if y'all read that I did something to a bicyclist, the possibility is quite high. Um, I pray not to and try not to, but patience. You know, it's, it's very challenging. When you see the gentrification, when the bike lanes tip, the people lanes and the car lanes and the bus lanes, where buses are hitting their brakes because they can't get around the bikes. I'm not bad at bicyclists much, but what I'm noticing is that the way that gentrification is happening is happening along class lines. And people are doing work on it. And again, then the question becomes, who got over and how? Down the street from me is an old lady. Um, they, her, her kids just put her in a home. Uh, she was kind of old. I mean, she's kind of old. She's like 90. Um, so she maybe needed to be in a home. But she had a beautiful home that's now been sold as being cut up into condos. And uh, she's someplace I would like to go see her, but it's way out in the burbs. I'll, go, I'll get out there occasionally, but I, I don't get out there as often as I'd like to. She's isolated from what used to be her home and the people who care about her because her kids want to make some money. Now, we could be mad at her kids, but we could also raise questions about how resources get divided, and that's part of the gentrification story. So am I wandering around this how, how I got over theme? I don't think so. What I think I'm attempting to do for you is to lay out some reasons that it's important for you to be involved in public policy. So the question is, getting through college and afterward. No, not getting through college, but how I got over. And after, how will I be the bridge that allows someone else to get over? What am I willing and prepared to do to make sure that someone else has opportunities that I really haven't had? And what questions am I willing to push, uncomfortable questions, that take us outside of our comfort zone? What kind of questions will I push that empower other people? And what kind of questions might you push? Well, as we look at, for example, the way that we're organized, or at least that we see ourselves in boxes, we might think about pushing these boxes out. We all think of our ethnicity as all important. I certainly do. I got back in the day, I used to get excited when I slow dragged to a song called Be Real Black for me. Because I thought that that was just really, really cool. Well, I still want to be real black, but I also want there to be opportunities to think about issues like immigration, and how does someone just go take somebody's land and then say they migrate? I mean, I think the only undocumented alien, or the first undocumented alien was Columbus. You know, he just came up in somebody's space and said, I discovered you. You know, when I get home, I hope nobody has discovered my artwork and is sitting in my house, because I locked it when I left. But in any case, that's what you call illegal, but we all across space lines have to be willing to raise those questions. People who are manipulative often say to African Americans, they're taking your jobs. But jobs don't have names on them. When you have one population that can be exploited, then everybody's exploited. The New Orleans story goes something like this. When Bechtel, multi-million dollar exploiter, when Bechtel got the contract to clean up New Orleans, here's how the deal went down. 
The union people got paid union wages, which tended to be 30-ish an hour. Non-unionized workers, many African-American men, got 20-ish an hour. Undocumented people got something closer to 7-ish an hour. And some got as little as 5-ish an hour. I don't want someone to be mad at the $5 people. You ought to be mad at the people who got all the money. Why be mad at someone? You weren't going to work the $5 job anyway. So be mad at the exploiter. The stories that came out in New Orleans would chill your soul. I went down and did some coverage. There was a hospital in Biloxi, Mississippi. Some Latino brothers, undocumented of course, were cleaning, were fixing this hospital that had been through the hurricane. One of them fell off a roof and was impaled by a rake. And they would not take him to the hospital because they did not have insurance on the crew. Finally, one of the co-workers had to put the man in his automobile and drive him to the hospital, which is dangerous. So he has a rake in him, been jostled to do that. Only after there's an um, organization down in Mississippi that organizes some of the recent uh, Latino uh, migrants, two years it took for them to get his hospital bills paid. People were not even fined. Hospital bills. He was not paid. Hospital bills. So when you allow that kind of exploitation, it can happen to every, anyone. When I say stretching, I mean stretching ourselves out of the questions people think we would ask. We have to ask the civil rights questions across the line. We have to ask the questions about race and gender. I want my brothers to be get, get asking questions about gender and being more responsive to issues around gender. I want straight folks to begin to ask more questions about the GBLT community. Because those are important questions to ask. We live in this planet together. How I got over. We got over to a better society. We decided that we were going to have one. But not just made a decision. People say that all the time. Well, I decided. But when real, clear, and concrete things are put into place, fair wages, health care, access, healthy children, food, just simple food, when those things are put into place for people to be able to live better lives. And when we're able to do that, we're able to talk about the growth and development of a society and the investment in our young people, which is an investment also for us. We won't meet the president's educational goals unless we make some investments. But we won't even be able to reach our own human goals until we make some decisions and make some changes in the ways that we spend not only our money, but our time. And so Maurice, I took your theme someplace I don't think you intended me to, but let me bring it back by saying just two more quick things before we have some questions. Getting through college and after. This is such a great time for you to ask yourself some questions. What do you want to do next? Not just going to class and putting one foot in front of the other. What do you want to do next? The life of the mind means you just don't read because you've been to class. It means you read because you love to read, because you're curious. It means lifelong learning. If you don't know a language now, Muy poquito espanol. I can't wait till I retire so I can learn some more Spanish and a few other languages too. Uh, but in any case, if you don't know one, learn one. I haven't tried Rosetta Stone yet, but here's what I do know. Only one in six Americans speaks a language other than their native language. One in six. I went to Copenhagen, and I wanted not to be an ugly American. So I took my little guidebook, and I circled what I needed to say. I wasn't going to be one of those folks pointing and carrying on. I even practiced my pronunciation. But I wanted to go to the Munch Museum, you know, where the guy is screaming, the big scream. I wanted to go to that museum. It wasn't worth my time, but I did go. So I start, you know, with very, very, very awkward pronunciation, trying to tell the man, Munch Museum. He looks at me, he said, look, lady, I speak English. I said, OK. He said, uh, he said I don't want to be, um, what do you say? I don't want to be rude. How much education do you have? I said, hmm? I said, well, I have a PhD. He said, oh, you have, you've been to school a lot. I said, yeah. He said, what do you speak? I said, English and muy poquito espanol. <laughs> he said, I speak three languages, and I went to the fifth grade. We don't do that in the United States. Any young person who speaks a language will have no difficulty finding a job, maybe two languages. And uh, Ebonics and Spanglish do not count for the record. But so, so one of the things I just said, learning is constant and living is constant. 
W. B. Du Bois once said, um, "You know, what did he say? he said, enjoy your life. No, enjoy all time because life has in, within it things that are good, things that are rich, and also things that are short. What do you do after college? You do whatever you want within reason, but you do it with the principle of the life of the mind, living a life, and certainly giving back. Thank you very much." I think we should thank Dr. Mavo one more time for that address. So at this time, we're gonna open up the floor to Q and A's, but first, just letting everyone know, we're gonna be providing food at the faculty dining hall. So if you wanna go get some food, you should go over there uh, now, okay? Or uh, after, after the Q and A. Um, so if you have any questions, I suggest you come up to the mics. We have mics in the back. Yes. Or if you're in the front, you can use one of the ones here. <laughs> Just don't run off with it. <laughs> Mike. <laughs> SM58, that's a good mic. Um. All right, Doc, thanks for being here. So uh, what happened, um, I come from a family of six on my mother's and my father's side. And uh, my cousin's daughter, you know, other cousin. Um, so all, out of all of us, she just finished doing an internship. And we said that we were very proud of her, and that's not something that usually happens in our community. And my cousin said she was driving back and forth between San Diego and LA every day. She's doing all this and that. So what can you say, speaking to interning, because I know especially here in New York, um, like I know there was some lawsuit going on in the fashion industry, you know, but something my father didn't understand because you know in his day you went you got a bachelor's and you're ready to work but it's not like that now and she did interning what do you know of sending your like the students you come in contact with interning or advising them how to get internships or even trying to get the older generation to understand that you have to intern because they don't understand working for free that's a really great question i would have I have so many stories I could tell you about that. I, I had a student who was utterly brilliant, and she got an internship at the United Nations. It was a small program. They had 12 students, including three PhD students, in this program. She was able to beat out some you know, junior at an HBCU, able to beat out people to get this internship. And then her mom said she can't have it because they weren't going to pay her. And you know, when you have your student financial aid form, it says this much is the parental contribution. Most parents expect their child to make that money over the summer. So if it says the parent has to give $2,000, the parent is expecting the child to come up with that. So that's what the mom said. She said she has to come up with a parental contribution. Now, I mean, I hustled my hind parts, find the alum to let that young lady stay with her here in New York over the summer, find another alum to give her $100 a week for spending change, find another alum to pick up the parental contribution. So that way it was like, I, I, I I can't believe I'm doing this, but you do it. I've had kids, not, not my kids, but friends, children, I, they get an internship in D.C., and their moms are like, well, they can come, but I don't know what they're going to stay. I'm like, okay, was that a direct request, a heavy hint, or what? <laughs> um, which I don't mind, because mentorship is one of the things that I enjoy doing. But I do think that in our community, um, it's really important for folks who are working class to understand the importance of internships, but it's also important for employers to pay interns. I mean, even if you're just paying them a stipend, I mean, someone should not go in their pocket to come to your business to provide value, even if they're learning. I mean, I've had folks work in my office, and literally, their, their professors like, well, they'll work for free. I'm like, okay, that's, if that's your story. But you give them something so they at least can get car fare and a meal. So, so corporate America, and, our ad agencies, the ad uh, industry is bad. Uh, media is bad. You have all these young people who are working for nothing. The challenge gets to be that these are the young folks who have a leg up. When it comes time for a real job, they've got a, le a leg up. So we've got to figure out ways to unpack that. Now, in terms of advising young people about internship, I advise young people to be extremely aggressive about their futures in terms of collecting people. In other words, if you have a semester here at John Jay, you ought to leave that semester with at least one professor who knows you well into that semester. 
knows your name, who would write you a letter of recommendation, pop in on every now and then, and they say, oh, yeah, man, uh, I just heard about this. You might be interested. Because you're building, essentially, your base. You don't have to know all of them. Some of them you may not ever want to know again, just for that class. But you have to at least, at the, at the end of every semester, have one. So by the time you're ready to graduate, you have a group of professors you can pick to write your letters of recommendation. Someone's going to have moved on something. So if you have eight at the end of your four-year college career, you should be able to get three good letters. Cultivating those folks as friends and mentors and sponsors is one of the ways to find internships. To ask them about what they know about, to ask them what other folks know about. But aggressive about your future also means you see somebody this probably happens to me four or five times a week, and I don't mind. A young sister will say to me, you know, I want to do the kind of work you do. Can I have your phone number? I'm like, no, you can have my email. Because people call you at odd hours. Um, but I, I, I'll give them an email, and we can chat via email, and we can chat via phone after that. But the point is that any of us who have made anything of them ought to be willing to give a young person 15 minutes for an informational interview. And that's often how you learn about what's going on. But I tell you, you've got to be aggressive. And you can't get yourself stuck in this notion that a role model is only somebody who looks like you. I had never seen an economist, to my knowledge, when I decided I wanted to be one. I had both of my parents are ABD. Um, and my mom was a social worker. My dad a teacher. I didn't know what an economist was. The only thing I knew for sure at about 11 or 12 as I was going to college. The only reason I knew that is because I had a, one of my good friend's sister got pregnant early and therefore by a fireman. So every day she's sitting at home eating ice cream that the fireman brought her. My friend Judy and I was there and said, shoot, she's living the life of Riley. You know, I want to eat ice cream from the fireman. So I went home and told my grandmother now, these folks were some working class white folks, which made my grandmother even angrier. I said, I want to be just like Judy Filipovic. I want to sit home and eat ice cream, and uh, the firemen will bring me ice cream every day, smack. I said, well, I said, you know, I said, I don't have to get pregnant. He could just bring me the ice cream, smack. <laughs> I was about to force back. I said, what's the problem here? She said, people in this family don't do things like that. I said, what, eat ice cream? She said, instead of work. So, you know, she said, you will be going to college. All of you will be going to college. And if you don't go to college, you're not going anywhere. I envisioned myself at 35, chained to my bed, because I hadn't been to college. Well, okay, I'm going to college. I got you. But, you know, I knew that, but I didn't know what. First econ class I took, I took because I couldn't get into a sociology class. You have to take your social science. They start talking about dividing up the money. You know, I got excited about that. They, then they said, who gets the money? I'm looking around at all these black people with no money. I'm like, surely not me. Let me try to figure this out. And the next thing you know, I'm doing economics. Uh, I had gone to um, undergrad, planning to go to law school. I think a lot of folks in my generation did. We just thought, saw that as a civil rights path. Go to law school, create some fair laws. But I ended up getting hooked on economics. But, but, but what I was saying, you don't have to have someone who looks like you to do. You have to read. You have to learn. You have to, I mean, the first real economist I met, um, well, no, I met him in um, undergrad professors, but Dr. Phyllis Ann Wallace was the first black woman to get her doctorate in economics from Yale, 1948. And she was my mentor, my big sister, and just a phenomenal woman. And when I, I was like, I had never really met a black woman who had achieved that much. By then, I was well on my way. She pushed. But I was well. So I, I want folks to have role models, but your role model could be somebody you picked a book up about and read. That that could be your role model. But we can't get stuck on. I need somebody to draw me a picture. If you're in graduate or professional school, you need mentors, and you need sponsors. But you don't necessarily need role models. And if you are graduate students in here, just a couple. We all know if you've ever heard me speak before, or even haven't, getting a PhD is like pledging. Just like pledging. Uh, I, I see an alpha shirt back there somewhere. So you, yeah. You a new, or you borrow somebody else's shirt. You're not supposed to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, a lot of this academic stuff, much of it is about what you know, but a lot of it is about how you roll. So keep that. 
Any other questions? My name is Isabel Campo. I am the junior representative of Student Council. Hello. My question is, what advice would you give not only to students of color, but to first generation students in college, I guess in terms of succeeding, just keep going forward, just not stopping? Great, that's a really great question. Keep your eyes on the prize. Keep your eyes on the prize, number one. No haters in your crew, number two. The haters can be friends and family. You just have to ignore them. I'm not saying throw them away. But when you leave your environment, when you leave the environment of where you grew up, a lot of people are going to tell you, who do you think you are? Are you bougie? Um, and you know what? Hell, there is nothing wrong with being bougie. You're not now, but you do aspire to be. Because what does bougie mean? I mean, you're not going to ride a hoopty for the rest of your life, I hope. Um, and I mean, bougie is just, it's how you define it. Um, so surround yourself with like-minded people who will encourage you. And love the other folks, but love them from a distance. And ignore them when you can. I mean, I've had students go home for the holidays come back, these are students who are doing very well. They went home and their siblings said, no, you, why, you don't need to do all that studying. And they come back and they're lagging. They were on the way to acing it and they're lagging because they let folks get into their head. So, you know, you, you can hang out with your peeps if you want to. Um, and then you leave your peeps where they are. See you next time. And it won't be all the time. It's challenging because that's where you come from. And they're people that you love and that you want to be with. And I think it's often also challenging for students of color because we allow the world to stereotype us. We, um, you know, I'm not dissing the brothers, but some of y'all who are sagging, they don't sag in your house. They do not sag in your house. Sagging is a function of prison activity. Or at least that's, I mean, that's where it came from. And the signals I don't want to know about. Um, but in any case, I mean, people keep telling me stuff. I'm like, really? Um, but somehow, some of us have got in our head that we have to be stereotypical. You don't have to be. There's nothing wrong with sag sagging. But did you ever see the video of the brother who's trying to run down the street and had to run out of his pants because they were dragging him down? No, seriously, it was very interesting. Um, but we, sometimes we put this sisters by under the um, a sister's flag around that we have to be neck rolling at all times and that, you know, it's against the law to leave your house with a body part covered. You know, I mean, so you, you are imitating somebody on a, a video that you don't even like. And we don't let, we should let those stereotypes in our head. No negativity. No negativity in our head. No negativity in our head. I think that's the most important thing. I think the second thing is to learn the culture. It doesn't mean lose your culture, but learn the What's college about? It's like the internship question that you asked about before. I'm going to tell you my favorite internship stories of a young woman, first generation. Um, who basically found an internship that um, didn't pay, found a place to stay, my house. Um, but I didn't mind. I mean, it, it was a friend of a friend of a friend situation. I was wondering if I had harbored an ax murder or something, just because I didn't know the girl. But she turned out to be a quite lovely young woman. But since she wasn't a cousin or a second cousin or a third cousin, I didn't necessarily feel like I had to feed her. I mean, she came up to get something to eat. It was cool. So she decided to work her unpaid internship during the day, and she took a waitressing job at night. So that she always has been to change. She, she lived D.C. like tourists do. She went to the museum, she did that because she worked as a waitress at night. She was determined to have that opportunity, and people would always say to her, I don't know why you work two jobs, because I'm getting opportunity. Uh, she won me over before it was over with. I was feeding her all the time. But that was no blessing, because I can't cook. Um, <laughs> But in any case, part of, she learned that an internship was going to be important for what she was going to do. Some of the other things, the conferences, the networking that takes place at professional conferences. I know so many students of color who don't go to professional conferences. Why am I going to go to that conference? I'm not giving a paper. It's not about you giving a paper. Even if you're a junior or a senior as opposed to a grad student, go to the conference so that you get exposed to what's going on in your field. So there's something to be said for like learning the culture and as you learn it, figure out what that means to you in terms of And bring somebody with you so that when you have an opportunity, there's you got a little sister, you've got a younger cousin, you got someone that come roll and sit in this class with you. So they get exposed to you. Oh, we have this gentleman first. Oh, okay. Um, how you doing? My name is Vaughn Wade. I'm a doctoral student. 
can hear you. Um, my question is, I was wondering if you could speak a little to the disjuncture of like pursuing a life of mine, but also being a black, a black person or a woman or you know, any other kind of uh, marginalized uh, individual and the type of pressures that the academy does, especially at, uh, you know, the, what, the, what, the, what doing a PhD means and like what that means for you and your political stances and beliefs um, and what that means for you becoming a professor on the tenure track and how do you reconcile that um, with having a life of the mind that truly, genuinely, you know, pushes the questions like you ask and really allows you to, uh, to, to do the type of work that you Wow, that's a great question. I wish, um, there's a quote that Ntutangi Shange had that said to be a academic, black and female, be a phenomenon that has not fully been um, recognized as something. I don't have the quote with me. But she really just talked about how many contradictions there were inherent in some of that. Uh, a PhD obviously is the highest level of academic attainment the academy has um, created, therefore, being in and of itself a sign of elitism, uh, with fewer than 1%, half a percent of all Americans having such degree, with the kind of resources going into uh, pursuing and attaining such a degree, um, a, a significant level of resources for an uncertain reward. If you go to get an MBA, you know you're going to get an MBA. You know, uh, what are you going to get with the PhD? Were you going to get necessarily a tenured professorship? Were you going to get, um, I don't know, a TV gig like a Melissa or a Rachel Maddow? Are you going to get, you know, it's, it's kind of up to you and not up to you. And so how do you explain it to the homies, essentially? When I went to get my doctorate, although my family is relatively academic, my grandmother, who was pretty disgusted with me at the time, said, uh, the same one who kept smacking me the other time, um, she said, so, going back to school, I said, yes, ma'am. She said, well, uh, for what? I said, my doctorate. You know what I'm working on, doctorate. She said, and what? I said, economics. I told you. She said, well, what was your master's in? I said, economics. I said, and your bachelor's? I said, economics. She said, and you didn't learn it right the first time? <laughs> <laughs> and all these economics degrees, and where are we going with this? So we somehow have to bridge that gap. And many times we feel guilty or not guilty we simply feel, like I always felt, the flip I made from doing academic writing, which I still do, to writing for USA Today, which I started doing in 1986, or for the black press, which I started doing in 1980, is I wanted more than three people to read my papers. My ego was sufficiently large that I could not imagine that you spent all this time with this thing covered with dust that nobody could do anything with. Whereas you knock out 500 words and you start a conversation about public policy and somebody runs with it, congressperson calls you and says, how could you clarify this so this turns into legislation? So I would admit it was a, it's pure ego, but I don't mind people who have egos. I mind people who have poor ego management. There's a difference. Um, have you ever, um, never mind, MC the rally where everybody wanted to go into the VIP tent, but all that was in there was a toilet? But everybody thought they were a VIP, so they fighting to get into the toilet. That is called poor ego management. I could tell you stories, but I won't. Um, but in any case, so you have to decide where you, where you want your work to fit on a continuum. And those are decisions you make for yourself. And some people will tell you that it's a waste of your doctorate to write for USA Today. That will be called their business. Some, and some people will be able to essentially juggle the two so that a... 500 word column comes directly from an academic article. Okay, that's where that's coming from so that you're able to keep a foot in both worlds. But certainly I think in, in, in terms of the quest for tenure, that part of your question is very, very um, dependent on the culture of your institution, the culture of your department, institution and your department, as well as the, all, all the other things that you mentioned. Because um, the perception is that the professoriate is very liberal. I don't necessarily find that to be the case. I mean, everybody is liberal. I don't see it that way. And I do think that there are some younger faculty who are um, 
implicitly penalized for their views. Again, as they told us back in the day, you have to you know, work twice as hard to get half as much. You have to make sure that your academic stuff is tighter than tight. And then you can do just about anything else, not just about anything else, but other things that may not be um, rewarded. The things that, I will say crack me, amuse me about the tenure process, uh, the collegiality. You just have to be very mindful of your decisions and also mindful of the fact that you get to make mistakes. Mindful of your decisions. Okay, at this time we're going to have one more question. Hi, Dr. Mabo, how you doing? Can Hi. You? Yeah. Um, Pull your mic up. You look so uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> Problems of a tall person. Um, how you doing? Um, I, my question is not half question, half comment. I don't really know how to ask it properly. Because um, like, I, I was in the military for a while. And that's the reason why I'm in college right now. It's the only way I can pay for college. And I find myself having to rely on the system that I want to change. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking about re-enlisting just so I could afford, you know, get more money than one day run for political office and use the military credentials to kind of slide my way in there. Because uh, I'm a Puerto Rican male. You know, I know I look white, but that's you know, life as it is. Um, but it's one of the things, like, how... So my question is, do you have any advice for people that have to rely on the system overly much? Or do you have any, you know, advice for people who want to change the system eternally, but, you know, kind of have to, like, rob the system to get where they have to go, because I kind of feel like that's where I'm at. Yeah. Well, you feel like using the military scholarship um, is relying on the system? It's, well, without it, I'd probably be a janitor somewhere. So. Darling, yeah. you earned that scholarship. Fair you, I mean, you, yeah, you earned it. So you, you, all you should feel is like, let, Audrey Lord had a statement that I always play with. She said, the master's tools cannot dismantle the master's house. And I always switch and say, let's let the master's tools dismantle the master's house. You can use that military education and your knowledge as a Puerto Rican brother to begin to change policy around the military. Remember, that was it's not too long ago that black and brown men were forced into the military when they had some little bitty shoplifting conviction. Well, we won't put this on your record if you go into the military. So, I mean, there's some things that you can do. I wouldn't even spend a minute wondering where my scholarship came from. You earned it. And you may learn more on, on the inside than you can use for others on the outside. Now, you may get to the whistleblower point, and then I'm not in it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, actually, I won't mean I'm not in it. I got your back. Um, I'll even give you my card. But um, they're, they're get, you get to be a, at a point where you know that you're going to be risking a lot, and there are going to be some major challenges. But use, you can use your knowledge to overturn the system. That's the whole point. That's why you went to the military, so you wouldn't be a janitor. And you went so you wouldn't be a janitor, so you could do something else. I guess that that something else had to do with changing things, how I got over. Not only for you, but for others. So go for it. I look forward to seeing your name in the paper. Let's give a round of applause to Dr. Hargrove. At this time, we will be concluding the event. Dr. Malvo um, has been invited to go on MSNBC tonight, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, MSNBC at 8 o'clock. At 8 o'clock, so she will be on what show? Chris Hayes. Chris Hayes. So she'll be on Up with Chris Hayes on MSNBC tonight, so make sure you check that out. Um, I give y'all a shout out if I get a chance. <laughs> we're, uh, I, what we want to do is uh, get a bit of a group photo, so if everybody wants to come up and have a group photo with Dr. Malvo. Oh, on the stage? Okay, I so. Down. What's, what works best? What will work best? And then we can head over and get some food in the um, faculty dining room. <laughs> 